for me, it's just somehow trying to make people incrementally better, putting them in positions to succeed, really celebrating their wins, helping them fix, you know, the losses, um, and just creating an environment that, that, that keeps people engaged and, and excited. Welcome to People Who Perform, the Real Estate Careers Podcast. Each episode will bring you conversations from business leaders and up and coming stars in the commercial real estate industry in Canada. Our guests will share their unique career journeys, passions, and advice on what it takes to be successful in this industry. This podcast is brought to you by Highview Partners, connecting people who perform in Canadian real estate. I'm your host, Richard Costello, and I'm pleased to introduce Chuck Wee. Chuck Wee is the Senior Vice President, Western Canada with Hudson Pacific Properties, responsible for operations of the Vancouver portfolio, which notably includes the 1.45 million square foot Bentles Centre, office and retail complex in the heart of downtown Vancouver. Prior to Hudson Pacific, Chuck was the Vice President for Oxford Properties, where he oversaw leasing and operations and participated in development and acquisitions. Chuck is currently on the board of the Downtown Vancouver Business Improvement Association and recently served on boards of NAOP and ULI's BC chapter. Chuck holds a Master's of Business Administration degree and a Bachelor of Business Administration from Simon Fraser University. Chuck, a big welcome to you and thank you for joining me. No problem, Richard. Uh, Happy to be here. So Chuck, you're well known in the industry. For close to 20 years, you were a key part of Oxford's team on the West Coast. And according to your LinkedIn profile, you leased over 4 million square feet in 15 years, including pre-leasing the MNP Tower. You've been involved in large acquisitions and development projects and are now at the helm of renovating and repositioning the Bentall Centre, which we'll come to later on. Not only are you well known, but you're also very well liked and respected in the industry. And I'm sure everyone would agree with me in saying that you're a very positive and optimistic person. So it would be interesting to learn more about how you became the person you are today. Can you give us a glimpse of what life was like for you growing up? Perhaps tell us who were your role models and how they influenced you. Uh, sure, Richard. And um, it's always nice to have the benefit of these questions in advance. But uh, sort of reflecting on the very early days, you know, I was uh, I come from a very middle of middle class family from the suburbs of Vancouver. And um, as a result, was probably an unlikely candidate to uh, get into the commercial real estate industry and kind of um, work my way up. But uh, I think in terms of the people that influenced me early on, it wasn't necessarily real estate people. I, I'd go back to the stock, you know, probably my parents. Um, my dad was a mechanical engineer and my mom was a nurse. And I think growing up kind of through my 20s, I was really kind of the analytical side of my dad. And I was really focused on finance and money and how to get ahead in business. And then as I got into real estate, I realized that actually it's probably the the influence of my, my mom, the nurse who sort of helped me move my way along my career, all the softer skills and dealing with people and being empathetic that kind of helped shape the, the latter part of my career. So I would say that's probably the, the stock answer, the easy answer, but probably the one that makes the most sense to me. Sticking with the theme of people having an influence on you, uh, during your formative years in the industry, did you have a mentor at all? Um, I, I wouldn't say I exactly had mentors. I had some really great bosses that I looked up to. You know, very early on, coming out of the co-op program at SFU, which is basically how you paid your way through school when you were middle middle class. Um, I didn't get the job I wanted, which was to be a financial analyst at uh, an investment bank here in downtown Vancouver. I got the second option, which was going over to Victoria and working at BCIMC with Chuck Swanson and Doug Pierce, um, two amazing leaders, really early days shaping the what's now the, um, the Quadrille portfolio um, and being involved with their vision and, and their connections and sort of having them help open some doors uh, was a fantastic experience. And then coming back over to Vancouver and having Tony Assels as a boss at Royal LePage Commercial and getting to know his network and having him open some doors for me. And then, you know, actually in the late nineties, I worked for the Bentall Corporation and having someone like Mark Shaparsky as our president was really able to watch how he worked and how he dealt with people and how he looked at the business. And so I I think I was lucky enough to stumble along some fantastic leaders and um, 
really take away some great things in terms of their style of working and their leadership roles and, and how they network and, and get to know people. Thanks for that, Chuck. And I know that you like to pass on all of that knowledge to the next generation as well, which is one of the nice things about this industry. So Chuck, you're used to taking on big projects, which require a lot of energy and staying power. What do you think drives your performance? Where do you find your source of energy? Uh, so this is an interesting question and it's funny. It's it really speaks to, you know, taking what we do, which we, some of us joke actually that what we do really isn't rocket science. Like when you work in commercial real estate and you're helping people lease office space, when you think about it, we joke and we say, Oh, what we're really doing is we're helping people borrow air. You know, it, you've got to find other ways to kind of engage yourself. And I think for me in reflecting on it, it's been great uh, on a couple of facets. It's great to develop teams um, and work within the real estate community and some of the personalities and, and, and being part of that network and also working with some of the best companies in Vancouver. Um, it's the kind of career where you wake up every morning, you've got three or four things on your to-do list for the day. And at the end of the day, you realize actually you never got to most of them because 14 other things came up. You were pulled into different meetings. You had a bunch of great ideas come up um, and you're able to kind of help people shape their own businesses and their worlds. So I think the energy comes from knowing that you're helping people achieve their goals. So whether that's internally on my own team, um, helping them with projects and moving those along or externally in terms of the great businesses we get to work with. And, um, you know, we kind of get a kick out of working on some of these projects, seeing them actually come to fruition and then seeing them in the headlines six months later. Um, you know, things like, uh, the Amazon deal that I worked on at 402 Dunsmuir, that was a year and a half in the making. And when the announcement finally came out months later, it was just so gratifying to have been part of that journey. Turning to your current role with Hudson Pacific properties for any of our listeners that, that might be unfamiliar, cause we'll, we'll have quite a few people tuning in from, from outside of Vancouver. What can you tell us about Hudson Pacific and the vision for the Bentall Center? So a little bit about Hudson Pacific properties. We're uh, publicly traded on the New York Stock Exchange, and we operate in West Coast markets that center on technology and media tenants. So the company was actually started by Victor Coleman, who was born in Vancouver. Uh, he was born on Hudson Street. It's actually why we're called Hudson Pacific Properties. Um, he built and sold a portfolio of real estate in the mid 2000s and he took that capital and he actually uh, bought uh, some sound, some sound stages. So today Hudson Pacific is the largest private holder of sound stages in Los Angeles on the Sunset Strip. So when Victor uh, acquired the sound stages in the early 2000s, he had this vision of uh, using the real estate there to build office buildings and you know, talent agents, accountants, lawyers that were dealing in uh, the media space could lease space there. And Netflix came along in the early two, 2010s and uh, decided to lease the first building. And today we've got three buildings of Netflix. We are their content headquarters. And it's really been the launching pad for growth for the company um, through Northern California, San Francisco, through Redwood Shores and San Jose, up to Seattle and uh, now into Vancouver. We really see Vancouver as the northern stop on this West Coast story of tech tenants and tech talent that wants to be in these these regions. And Vancouver just has so many good things about it. You know, if you're in Canada, um, I like to think a lot of people spend their lives trying to get to the West Coast and uh, there's no better place to be. And being part of that story of West Coast centers of media and technology, I think, is just a fantastic way to kind of weave that story together. So in terms of the work that we're looking at in the Bentall Center, really what we what we try and articulate is that there's three parts. And I got to be clear, like the Bentall Center is a trophy downtown urban asset. It's actually never had a problem staying leased historically. A lot of companies will always have it on their list of places to be. What we wanted to do was make sure that that priority stayed in, in the fronts of people's minds in terms of having the Bentall Center as being the place to be. And so we wanted to reposition the asset so it was ready to deal with any of those tenants that wanted to come up from the other markets. And, and we phrase it in terms of three buckets. So what we wanted to do early on in the acquisition was focus on some early wins. After those are underway, we would focus on larger repositioning projects. 
And then that would pave the way to looking at the third bucket, which is actually the development on site, because we can unlock about 400,000 feet of development density. So the early wins are the uh, smaller projects that you see now emerging around the site, whether it's opening up the plazas, adding lights and music, you know, renovating the retail concourse, it, uh, the first 50 feet experience when you go into the parkades now, it's just a completely different sense of arrival. And we wanted to sort of use those projects to trigger uh, larger repositioning elements around the site. And I can't talk about those today, but uh, in terms of the design meetings that we've been having on the repositioning elements, uh, they are truly going to be, I think, projects that are going to uh, get people's attention and, and hopefully keep the Bentall Center uh, front of mind as they look at returning downtown. Um, and as those repositioning elements get launched, um, we're also in design for a future development on site. And uh, we hope to be submitting a development permit for that later this spring. And again, just when people see it, I, I hope that they uh, can appreciate the um, kind of innovation that's going to go into that development and really kind of lock in Bentall Center for, you know, take something great that was great for the past 50 years and make it great for the next 50 years. Yeah, no, fantastic. Thank you. Well, I know you're pretty optimistic about the potential that Vancouver has to take advantage of the the wave of tech firms looking to establish themselves in, in the city. In January of last year, right before the pandemic, you spoke at a UDI luncheon to a packed audience of 1,200 people, which seems almost wild to think about right now, about the 50 million square feet of additional office space that the city would need to accommodate this demand. So from what you've seen and, and have been hearing from tech groups this past year, are you still as bullish on this? And, and what do you predict the I guess the the lasting impacts of this past year will be on our relationship with the with the office. So great question, and I actually had to go and pull up my notes uh, from that <laughs> EDI conference last year. And uh, you know, something that I actually don't get credit for, but somebody mentioned to me the other day was at that very same conference, there was a question about what keeps me up at night and what could kind of stop the party. And my answer actually was, I said it, I said that it was going to be a black swan. And so in my home office, I actually went and found it. Uh, so I'm going to hold it up to the screen. People can't see it, but I'm holding it up for you, Richard. And this is this is the Globe and Mail from the day of the UDI forecast. And the top headline on Thursday, January 23rd, 2020 is China closing off city at center of coronavirus outbreak. So I read that headline that day. And when I, I knew I had it in my notes, when I talked about a black swan, I said, it's going to be something strange that comes at us out of left field. And it's going to be something that could impact urban centers. And here we are a year later and the black swan came. We're doing our best managing through it, but um, to move on to your actual question about, am I still bullish about the future? It was the city of Vancouver that noted we would need 57 million square feet by 2050 to accommodate this surge in demand. And I'll steal a line from uh, my good friend, Bob Rennie. I had Bob come in and speak to our group last summer. And Bob says, in the 1930s, we had the Great Depression. In the uh, early 2000s, 2008, we had the Great Recession. And Bob is calling this the Great Suppression. So um, in the charts that he and Andy Ramlow had put together, you look at the growth and the pace of growth and the fundamental facets of uh, the Vancouver region. And he said, it's a bit of an unstoppable machine. And yes, there is an impact from uh, everything that happened in 2020. But his feeling was, and the signs were pointing to a much quicker rebound and that you could just take the part of the chart that had the upward curve and slide it over by about 18 to 24 months. And it would simply be a suppression and that we'd come back. So I'm an optimist and I really like what Bob Rennie has to say. So I'm going to go with Bob and say that it's a great suppression. And yes, we will ultimately need uh, that amount of office development, albeit a few years later. Yeah, no, thank you. And I think if there's perhaps been one place to be, one major metro market to have been uh, during this whole global pandemic, Vancouver's been been such a good spot just in terms of access to green space and, and kind of forgetting what's going on in the rest of the world. So that's not going anywhere either, is it? No, I think that that quality of your life is what everyone points to. You know, I speak to my LA counterparts almost daily and, uh, we talk about um, our environment here and how they just can't wait to get back, you know? Yeah. 
it's uh, one of their favorite cities. Yeah. Well, you, you kind of touched on the plans at the Bentall Center a few moments ago, but I guess if you could, if you could maybe pinpoint what excites you most about the plans underway at the Bentall Center and, and then maybe give us a taste of, you know, what, what, what's going to be different for anyone returning that's, that's been away for the past 12 to 18 months. What do they have to look forward to? So we do want to be cautious with uh, the reopenings, but we are looking forward to, as, uh, as I had one consultant put it to me, he said, oh, you're adding software to the hardware now. I said, yeah, it's events and activations. So we've hired a new program manager at the Bentall Center, and the goal is to create an environment that people are really going to look forward to coming back to. So as we launch the plaza areas, we've added power out there. We've got speakers to uh, uh, put in music. Um, and one of the things we want to do is actually tie it into the corporate initiatives of, of Hudson Pacific. So uh, in terms of the company's ESG platform, last year in 2020, we decided to really advance the S of ESG, the social impact portion. And the company elected to donate 1% of our net earnings to charitable causes. So in 2020, that really came about in the way of helping homelessness issues, as well as um, frontline workers and, and frankly, food poverty. So uh, we did a Feed the Frontlines campaign where we helped small local restaurants. We did takeout orders and we brought that food to um, Covenant House, the workers at Covenant House, nurses, uh, firefighters, uh, and essentially all the frontline workers that were essential services. And that was a nice way to dovetail support for local businesses and the future um, and essential services and the future uh, what we have elected to do this year is earmark half of that capital towards um, arts and culture. So we actually have a budget to support the starving artists that have lost rehearsal spaces, have lost their venues, and we hope to use some of our new areas to support that community, uh, whether it's rehearsal space or a vacant retail space for someone that wants to do fine art. Um, we can support those artists as we come out of uh, the pandemic. Are you looking for a recruitment partner that understands your unique hiring needs and can truly represent your business to the market? When you work with Highview Partners, it will feel like an extension of your company. Our process is proven to help you find exceptional talent, which we accomplish by understanding your company's values and culture first. We then commit to a strategic plan, navigate any challenges, and find the candidate who fits the role and your company best. Together, we will help you build a winning team. To discover more about our services, contact us today or visit us at highviewpartners.ca. Chuck, I'd like to turn to the topic of leadership. You clearly have a leadership style, and I don't know whether you've been able to articulate this or if it's been articulated for you, but how would you try and define your leadership style and how did you come about it? And also, how do you keep working on it? Um, so this is a tricky question because there's so many great leadership styles out there. And, and for me, I just tried to reflect on um, what it means to make to build good teams and, and how to create that stickiness that has people really excited to come to the office every day. And for me, it's just somehow trying to make people incrementally better, putting them in positions to succeed, really celebrating their wins helping them fix, you know, the losses um, and just creating an environment that that, that keeps people engaged and, and excited. Um, you know, when I was coming up in the business, I was a young leader. I was sort of put in a position early on where I had to manage people with a lot more experience than myself. And so it was harder to lead by example. So for me, all I could do was uh, try and create environments that was going to that was going to allow people to succeed. And now that I'm, a, I guess I would say I'm an older leader, uh, what I try and do is open doors and connect dots for people to make them better. Um, you know, as I reflect on Ashley, our, our new program manager and the things that she's trying to do, we had some great meetings actually with uh, Royce Twin at Tourism Vancouver and Ken Cretney down at the Vancouver Convention Center, trying to articulate the activations we're doing and seeing her career take off with these new connections and, uh, the ideas that are coming about like that is a perfect example of my goal day to day. Just how do I create environments that are going to allow people to excel and succeed? 
Yeah, fantastic. And and I guess my next question you you sort of touched on it's about how how do you build these winning teams then? What 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 are the steps that you take to do that? So I think one of the things that uh, really attracted me to Hudson and something that I believe in was a philosophy of the culture comes first. So really finding people that line up with um, your view of the world, how they want to work collaboratively, uh, how they want to be open, how they want to celebrate their wins and figure out their losses. You know, a lot of that goes into how we recruit and recruit talent and, and attract them and retain them in our own office. So, you know, when we reopened our office after Labor Day, because we are an essential service, there were, I'll, I'll, someone else used the term, so I think I can use it, squeals of delight. Like when the people <laughs> were able to see each other and come back in the same space, it really just validated that, okay, we've hired into a really good culture. Um, and we've doubled the team over the 20 months I've been here. We've gone from 12 to 24 people. So to see those bonds being created and uh, having that really be a hallmark of this office is just really gratifying for me. That's fantastic. Chuck, what advice would you give to someone who's stepping up into a leadership position for the first time? So, you know, the philosophy I've I've had for a while now is that real estate is a very long game. Like it's it takes decades to build buildings and uh, even longer than that to develop portfolios and the real estate will outlive you. So I think the perspective I would give people that are going into leadership positions is you're being handed the wheel of a, of a ship that's going to outlast you. So just make sure you have a commitment to steer that ship and leave it in a better place than you found it. So something that I always tell people that work for me is I've got to work with you so that you take my job because one day you will take my job. And if you do, that means I've gone on to bigger and better things. And, you know, that happened to me over at Oxford. I was able to work with a great young guy like Ted Milden, and he's um, had a fantastic career as well. And, you know, essentially he's doing a lot of the elements of my old job. And I, I, I spent a lot of time trying to equip Ted to do that so that I could come over here and try and do the work that I'm doing today. And moving on just a little bit more and into the get to know you here then. So what, what would people be surprised to hear that you're, that you're good at, Chuck? I think most people know that you like to play golf, but yeah, any, any surprises? Yeah. Um, and my son is going to, going to, going to kill me. He's going to be so embarrassed, but you know, we raised our kids to be talented at a lot of different things and they played the piano and the guitar and, uh, uh, I read an article in in COVID that said, you know, you should not waste the pandemic. You should figure out a skill and pick it up. And a lot of people have started baking and doing things like that. And my son came to me and said, dad, you, you really got to play an instrument. You know, you've made us take music lessons for our whole lives. So you should figure out uh, what your instrument is going to be. And so I actually went and, uh, because I love Hawaii so much, I went and bought a ukulele. And so I've been learning a little bit of, uh, a little bit of this, so. <laughs> That's what I've got for you today, Richard. A little bit of the ukulele. <laughs> Oh, I absolutely love that. That's the first time anyone's brought an instrument on. I'm, I'm so glad you got these questions in You know, advance. you should make it, you should make it a hallmark of your <laughs> podcast is somebody's got to play an instrument at some point. <laughs> I thought that was very good. So you've, you've literally just picked that up from the last year. Yeah. And anyone that can play the ukulele will tell you that it's <laughs> actually uh, very simple, but I hope to get a lot better at it. Okay. Well, I've got a few quick fire questions here, which you, which you didn't have in advance. So let's uh, let, let me pick five of these. So if you had 25 hours in a day, how would you use your extra time? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, if I have 25 hours, how would I use my extra time? I have a book by my bedside that I've passed over in favor of reading many, many other books. Um, and it's The Death and Life of Great American Cities by Jane Jacobs. And uh, I've been dying to get at it for years. And so I would spend the extra hour just reading a few pages out of that uh, every night. And it's very appropriate for what we're going through now, I think. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, on the book theme, what book have you read that changed your life the most? I think the the book that I, I would say has changed my view of a lot of things is the one I actually read the most re recently. And it was uh, Reed Hastings from Netflix and his book about called the No Rules Rules. Um, and I highly recommend it. It's, uh, 
I, I, I plowed through it in a weekend. Okay. So great reading for all those emerging leaders out there. What is your favorite sport to watch and why? My favorite sport to watch would have to be, um, and I won't say any of the ones you'd expect, but uh, Olympic level, uh, Olympic level volleyball. So my sport growing up, I was a gym rat and uh, I played actually college level volleyball. And when I see the level of skill and athleticism in those players, men's and women's teams getting together for the Olympics every four years, it's, uh, it's mind blowing uh, how those teams come together and how well they play. What's your favorite place of all the places you've traveled? Two summers ago for my brother's 50th birthday, we actually went to a, a went on a tour of, uh, of England and Scotland and we ended up sleeping out the night before the, at the starters hut at the old course at St. Andrews. And um, we managed to get on the course. We were the only two to get on in the afternoon because the, the senior um, European open was, was held there just a few days prior. And uh, there was a lot of pent up demand and we got to play the old course at St. Andrews on a beautiful summer day. At, and we closed off the 18th hole at sunset uh, both parring the the closing hole and having our kids walk up 17th hole, the road hole and the 18th hole crossing the bridge together was an absolute joy. So we'd love to try and do that again. Awesome. Have you ever been told that you look like somebody famous? Who was it? Oh, absolutely. You know, when I golf in the summer, uh, my, my headwear of choice is actually a visor. So I've been told I look like KJ Choi, which I think is a compliment because he's got the, uh, the physique of a Korean tank. I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> all right that's all the questions i have for you chuck you'll be glad to know uh thank you very much for your for your time it's been great to catch up lots of fun thanks uh, richard really appreciate the opportunity cheers thank you for listening to people who perform the real estate careers podcast brought to you by highview partners a talent search and recruitment firm focused exclusively on canadian real estate if your real estate team is looking to find the best next hire, or if you're ready to make the best next move in your career, then reach out to Highview Partners today. Follow us on LinkedIn and visit us at highviewpartners.ca.